I don't have to tell all of you folks that manage a racetrack, big or small, how tough of a job you have because you understand it more than this media knucklehead does. But our next panel is uh, really kind of an interesting mix and it's, I think, going to give you some ideas on some ideas on, on how to maybe manage your track a little bit better uh, or make a few changes. Um, and that's whether you're a big track, a small track, circle track, road course, drag strip. I don't think I left anybody out. Um, so let's meet our next panel down on the end. Mr. Double D, good to see you. Mr. Dave Dusick, he's the founder of Racetrack Engineering. Dave is known for his innovative use of video for racing events and also for finding affordable solutions to racetrack problems for uh, big or small tracks. His expertise has been utilized for many years by the folks at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway here in town and also series like Global Rally Cross. We've seen him at F1 events. You know, you're just a world traveler lately. Um, but small tracks can also benefit from his expertise as a problem solver too. Mr. Dave Dusick, welcome aboard. Man, I need to hire you as a PR guy. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> I even like myself after that. There you go. <laughs> Sean Johnson is the Executive Director of Operations for Charlotte Motor Speedway, and there are so many moving parts at Charlotte. It's crazy. Um, Sean's expertise is, is really kind of unique because become, before getting this headache uh, at Charlotte Motor Speedway, uh, he spent seven years as an emergency service coordinator at NASCAR. Uh, before working his way up at Charlotte. So, Sean, welcome aboard. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. This is an awesome group here. Uh, been good so far, so hopefully we can deliver on this. John Collette is the manager of Motorsports Solutions for GeoBrug, and we sort of, uh, sort of discovered GeoBrug and what you guys were doing uh, a few years ago at a racetrack business conference meeting here, and we were just so amazed we had to bring you back. So... Uh, <laughs> Different, different member from GeoBrug than we had before, but uh, GeoBrug, if you haven't heard about them yet, uh, they gained nor notoriety with their unique rockfall containment systems over in Europe, and now their systems not only enhance motorsport safety, but although you guys don't brag about this, I will as a photographer, I'm amazed at how much better the sight lines are. Um, some of the tracks, they're kind of cheating us photographers how close we can get to the road course action, but shooting through one of your fences is a lot easier. A lot of than people it. forget about Clarence Jr. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, John, welcome Thank aboard. And finally, our uh, exchange program with the folks over at ICMS, uh, the International Council of Motorsports Science. Um, we got uh, Frank, and uh, we also, I think, got a first-round draft pick for next season so we're we're really doing well here um but frank is, holshoff is uh the global sales and marketing direction uh person over at hagen and uh the, it's amazing i could pronounce that pretty yeah, close that, that was not bad at all actually yeah, your so dutch is quite impressive for, for a dumb american don't speak much a English. Lot of <laughs> and you're fine i got it there so anyway hagen is a worldwide leader in manufacturing fire and safety training tools and checking out their website, I was really amazed with the state of the art. You guys are ahead of the state of the art, in my opinion. But their equipment will revolutionize the training of firefighting personnel um, for both big tracks and I think for small tracks eventually. It's going to be pretty unique. So welcome aboard and thank you for lending your expertise to the panel. Thank you very much. So Dave, I'm going to start out with you. Uh, and what is the number one thing that tracks can do to improve the fan experience? Uh, I, I go to the track and I hear audio and barely hear audio, uh, but what is the best thing that they can do to fix up their track for next year, uh, most cost effective? I appreciate that. Start out with a million dollar question at me. Um, <laughs> I, I think if we asked 60 people in this room, you might get 60 answers. I know the women in this room would probably say the, the restrooms, right? Um, no, I, I think there are a lot of things, but honestly, just last week, and this is going to sound like a sales pitch, but I promise it's not. Just last week, I saw a poll um, asking that, you know, what, what can we do 
to make the experience better at racetracks. And amazingly enough, to my pleasant surprise, um, a good PA system and a good announcer were both atop that list. And um, I think this day and age, we get so caught up in technology and wanting to do telephones and all these different things and video and whatever it may be, that sometimes we lose sight of the simple truths. And the simple truth is that, you know, before there was all of that, um, the PA system was how you entertained your fans. And um, if you've ever read Chris Economaki's book, he talks about the, uh, I think he called it the Ballyhoo, um, in the old days of the fairs where he would, he would go out and make the show sound amazing and he would, you know, oh, look, he's on fire and blah, 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 you know, just to get people in the gates, right? Well, I think we've lost that. I think in today's society with all the gadgets and all the, um, we, we spend so much time and energy trying to find the latest and greatest technology to make fans happy. I think we, sometimes we lose sight of the basics of just a, a good PA system and a good announcer that, you know, that a good announcer that you can understand will go a long way for a show. And Sean, everybody thinks the Charlotte Motor Speedway is a big track, but you're a big track with a couple of little tracks and a drag strip and you guys have so many things going on. What have Nothing you we don't have? <laughs> well, this is it. Road course, several configurations. What have you learned on managing the small track that you might think would come in handy for racetrack promoters of all sizes is, you know, how to manage this size of a facility and this, all the different moving parts. Yeah, I think just to elaborate a little bit on what Dave said to start off with, and then I'll move into that question. Um, I, I think what we're seeing as racetracks and what we're seeing uh, even in the live sports and entertainment world, um, and I know I'm the guilty party when I go to sporting events, I don't care to sit in my seat for four hours. I don't, I don't, uh, um, that's not all that exciting to me all the time. I want to be part of the event. I want to be there. And I think as facilities, we can look at ways to enhance that, that guest experience um, uh, at, at the event. They still want to come. They still want to be part of the big show. Uh, but then maybe they don't want to sit all the time. So th those are things as our facilities are aging, um, and most are, uh, it's time to look in that direction and try to see how can we, you know, make it better for the fans. And, and one of our mottos that Mr. Smith has come up with for decades is that we work for the fans and that's how we enter our job every day at work. Uh, that is that is our, our goal every day. Um, how do you manage the short tracks with the big track? Um, it, it's it's interesting and we've done a lot of soul searching with this. Uh, another part of our company is also US Legends Cars International so we have a vested interest in seeing short track racing be successful. Uh, dirt tracks, road course racing and even our little fifth mile track. Uh, when you have such a big pond, when you have the only four lane drag strip in the world and a mile and a half super speedway, you can try to lose sight of the short track stuff, but that's how our industry is being built. That's our future. Um, the miners that we talked about at length in the last session, uh, getting them out, getting them interested in the racetracks in the venue itself is important. And uh, you know, another uh, way of we've diversified as well uh, is trying to bring those 15 to 34 year olds in with different, uh, different events uh, with motocross and uh, rally car racing and um, different types that we've brought in in concerts. Uh, Monster Energy's Carolina Rebellion, which is one of the biggest in the state of North Carolina now, is something that we host at the, at the Speedway. So uh, trying to get them there, get them to see the short tracks, get them to uh, uh, understand how important grassroots racing is. Our relationship with uh, um, Tom Deary and the World Racing Group is phenomenal, and that's grassroots of grassroots. Um, that, that is so much fun to put on those two weeks that we did this year. Uh, with the World Finals capping that off, um, hundreds of race cars and racers. Um, it, it's important to uh, to put that out there and to uh, show that this business is huge. And, and even though we're a big 2,200-acre facility, that all levels of motorsports and racing are important to us. John, we're always hearing about, you know, how can we make the cars safer and how can we make the tracks safer to protect the, the racers. Um, do we sometimes forget that we need to also protect the fans and media folks, photographers that are out there? I mean, uh, and even the track workers. Yeah, I, I don't know if we forgot about them, but they're definitely uh, a lot of times on the back burner. I think that's changing a little bit now with every accident that happens. Uh, but I think more needs to be done for the fans and especially the track workers who for the most part are volunteers. A lot of times they give up their time because they just love what they do. They love the sport. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is that everybody goes home safely at the end of the day. And so 
I think we just need to go the extra step, go the extra mile, and, and do everything we possibly can do. And Frank um, Hagen, I, did I do better that time? Yeah, still doing good. All right. You guys are really on the cutting edge of, of firefighting training technology. Can you tell folks a little bit about this system that you guys have come up with and how it might benefit their racing series or their racetrack in the, fu in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to give a little bit of a background on our company, uh, it is indeed half of it is called uh, Hagen, indeed. The other half is called Bulex. Uh, we are an uh, American slash Dutch uh, company. Been around for about uh, 25 years, and we specialize in the training training equipment for firefighters. And this ranges from very small smoke generators to very large tra training sites of a mile by a mile, including. Uh, airplanes on uh, full-scale high-rise buildings, uh, all that kind of stuff that you want a firefighter to be able to work in when they show up at your door to extinguish your kitchen fire, because it's nice if they know what they're doing. Um, so that's our, that's our business. And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we have got a request from the Grand Prix of uh, Monaco um, if we could build them a Formula One fire prop, uh, which is something that we can, so we did. Uh, and they've been uh, training with that for uh, for a while now, um, and that made us think of expanding more into the motorsport world. So uh, we joined the ICMS here next door, uh, and we will be presenting, and I think this is also a presentation that you will receive, a new model of uh, a modular training system, which we call an escalating training system, which includes digital training. So you can actually train on digital panels that you can sit put in the pit lane, for example, without uh, having any danger of, uh, uh, of the fuel combust combusting and things like that. So it is all about uh, training the real life scenarios at the place where the actual fire is gonna be. Uh, and to round that, uh, that an answer up, you might have, have the experience that you drive past a hospital and you see the nurses doing extinguisher training outside on the parking lot. Never in their life will they ever have to extinguish a fire in the parking lot. So why are we training over there? They are gonna, uh, if they're ever gonna confront the fire, it's gonna be either in the kitchen or it's gonna be in the OR. So that's why we want to bring the training to that place. And the same goes for motorsport. The fire is very likely gonna be in pit lane. It's gonna be in the pit box. So let's make sure that we do the training over there. And that's why these digital panels can, uh, can really help us. Okay, um, I hear high tech, I think high cost. Depends. I think the, the cost of a life is higher than a panel. We're going to open up for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and keep it up for a little bit so I can see and, and get to you. But while I'm doing that, uh, Sean, one of the big changes in racing here um, for a lot of the big tracks, um, for instance, Bristol Motor Speedway, their most profitable event this year was a football game. It was not a race. Um, so what changes have you guys seen that you need to make at your speedway in order to host other types of events? Because you've got all the facilities. When you own a track, you have all of the, the bathroom facilities. You have all of the infrastructure to hold great musical events or other big events. What changes have you had to make, though, in order to make those events better for the participants. Yeah, the uh, man, that football game was awesome. Um, but uh, that's that's something as a company that we're looking at. We enter work every day, and I know I do. That there's there's nothing in front of us that we can't host. Um, if there's something that uh, uh, is out there, we want to be a part of that. Uh, we do 1,200 plus events a year. Uh, at the Speedway from small to large. There's 12 things. I looked at my calendar just a few minutes ago. There's 12 things going on today at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the Dragway, um, and the Speedway Club uh, just right now as we're sitting here, uh, different different functions and, and racing things and commercial shoots that are happening right now. Uh, so, you know, every day is ever-changing and ever-evolving, and that goes with every event as well. Yes, parking is in place, infrastructure is in place, uh, facilities are in place, and then it's just figuring out how we can use it. Uh, you know, the, the, the NASCAR um, uh, model has, has seen a shift, uh, still very good, uh, very strong, but with the investment and the capital that's been put into these facilities, it's, it's time to figure out the other ways that we can use them. 
uh, and in you know different racing organizations and different live entertainment. Uh, that's that's our our direction and, and where we're heading. Um, so really, there's nothing that we won't do. The one thing I would say, um, and I know it came up in the last uh, panel discussion, that you need to have as a racetrack is an awesome working relationship with your local authorities, um, to where you're you're closely working with the police department and the fire department, uh, the city management. Uh, we have a phenomenal, unlike what maybe you've heard in the press in the last 10 years, we, we have a great working relationship with our local authorities. Uh, it, and, and that's important when it comes down to hosting different events because they've done NASCAR races for 60 years. You go throw a big concert on top of them, that's way different. So um, uh, we're thankful to have the support of the, of the county and the city uh, to, to bring these large scale um, events to the Charlotte and Concord area. John, when you're brought in on a project with GeoBrug of updating the catch fences, are, is that something that you're seeing from clients now that they're sort of, you know, multi-purpose facility in addition to just being a racetrack? Yeah, that's one factor. The other factor is technology has come so far in the last even 10 years, let's say, but you go to older facilities where fencing is, is 50 years old, it, it's time to start thinking about uh, replacing that, upgrading it with, uh, you know, better technology. Uh, just because you haven't had an accident doesn't mean you're not ever going to have one, and I think that's some people forget about that fact. And, and the technology gets better and better every year, and that's what you have to think about. And Dave, are you seeing any of your clients? I know you've got a very affordable um, program where you're helping out um, with tracks that, that need new audio equipment. Are you starting to see, you know, small tracks even looking at, hey, maybe we can hold a, a concert or something uh, and have to, to sort of think about their facility management as a result? Yeah, I think so. I, th I mean, I think you look around the room and the people who are in this room, I think everybody, the world's starting to get flat now and everybody's realizing, hey, we've got to, you know, we've got to think outside the box a little bit, like like you talked about, Sean. I mean, it's, at some point, we just, we've got these facilities and the infrastructure, you know, we've got to, uh, we've got to use them. My, my one question on that for you, Sean, is um, what changes? You know, we see different crowds and different patterns at the Speedway for MotoGP than we do for the Indy 500, than we do for Brickyard, because they're different clientels. Um, how, for these folks, how much does that what changes are there? Do you see different operational procedures like you talked about um, for a concert versus a NASCAR race? And, and how do you address that? Huge different. Believe it or not, the uh, concert fan is a little more polite. <laughs> um, they, they are, and it's a, it's a rock concert that we do. Um, it, they, they don't pick up after themselves as well. But yeah, there's a lot of different, uh, different dynamics, and it's a lot about communication and planning and working through those issues. Um, the first year is always the hardest. After that first year, then it gets a little bit more routine, and you can plan for what you've seen and what you have. Um, you know, we we host five and six hundred um, person weddings and proms and things like that in our speedway club. So that's something else that that goes into our day to day planning. So it it's a wide variety of event planning that that we do. So yeah, it's it's an ever changing day to day. Everything's different, uh, but yeah, there are some operational struggles that go with that. Uh, but a lot of the parts and pieces are in place, or or will be we'll be searching f to put those parts and pieces in place. Yeah, I think that on the short track front, I think that's something that, um, to, to your original question, Dennis, that a lot of people are just, they're essentially leasing the facility. So, you know, I, if you're a racetrack promoter, you're not necessarily a concert promoter. So it's, you team up with a good concert promoter and you let them do the concert part and you do the facility part. And it seems to work really well. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Busby. I'm with uh, NCM Motorsports Park. Um, we saw our first Tesla do a track day this year, and so looking into what the equipment needs to fight any kind of uh, um, fire or incident with uh, the lithium ion stuff and uh, what to expect um, training wise and, and uh, equipment wise. So I, I think that that's indeed one of the things that uh, all of us are, are quite concerned about. What, what does the whole uh, electric engine uh, part means for uh, for our industry. Um, for us, from a tr training point of view, what we've done with the digital uh, equipment is we programmed uh, the behaviors of a uh, of a e electrical fire in there. So if you would uh, take the say you, you would take the um, the wrong extinguisher, um, it would re it would respond in 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 a be in a way that shows you that you're doing the wrong thing. Um, that, that that so far is is I think the best that, that we can do. 
from a from a tra training point of view. Um, you, you see also on uh, on the day to day uh, uh, in the day to day world with, with Teslas when there is a crash, firefighters seem to be very uh, reluctant to go in the way they would with a normal uh, normal car. So I think uh, yeah, training on that is is going to be more and more important, not just for the completely electric car, but also for say uh, cruise systems and, uh, and and so on. So in the prop that we are presenting, there's also for example a wheel fire related to the cruise uh, system. So both electric as well as uh, with the oil uh, fire. Uh, David Bodden, Thunderhill. I heard a reference to Saturday Night Racing, the local grassroots tracks being a critical component as we feed off them going up the line. I see them as dying. I see them as going out of business in, to a very large extent, especially where the operator is older and doesn't need to make the revenue that a normal job would pay. Uh, they can't invest in them because some of them, like in California, are on state property. So what do you see the short track uh, role in the future, and do you feel that it's doomed to ultimate failure or consolidation, which is probably what will happen with your place in Charlotte? Uh, but anyway, I think, it's a, I think it's in a state of extreme change, and I think the change is going to result in a lot fewer of those Saturday night racetracks. What's your opinion? Sean, I'll be interested to hear what, what, what your thought on it. But I, I, I think that to some degree you're right, but I think on the other front, you're the perfect example. Um, I think that there's no more middle ground. You, you can't just open your gates and expect people to show up. That The guys, the old school guys that are doing that, they're the ones that are going away. But the guys who are progressive, the guys who are figuring out how to, um, how to entertain today's fan, you're seeing great success. You can, you can go a mile down the road and see a great successful racetrack and then another one down the road that, that's not. And this guy's saying that the market's all dried up and it's, nobody likes racing anymore. And this guy down here is, you know, just like you, doing great because he's got new ideas and he's doing cool things. So um, I don't think short track racing is in a decline. Um, I think that there are some people who are, but I also I see, I see racetracks flourishing right now. Um, and it, some of it's geographical, but it's, a lot of it has to do with mentality, business mentality. You know, I mean, do you agree with that, Sean? Yeah, I think the word you used with consolidation may be where we're at as far as uh, of that goes. I, I think it does pain me to see, uh, I work for the American Speed Association uh, as well, it pains me to see that series go away. It pains me to see the tracks that they race that closing on a regular basis. Um, so those of us that love short track racing or have grown up in that, um, it's, it's a struggle, but you have to have a passion for it. You have to have a drive for it. And like Dave was saying, I think if you have that in a promoter, it's a nonstop job. I can't, I can't imagine, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work at a big facility that has a team that's doing that kind of work, but um, the short track world is tough. I think it's more of a consolidation than it is anything. Uh, we started this year with, with uh, Tom, uh, the World Short Track Championships on dirt. We had 400 cars. People want to race. Legends cars is the same way. We saw, we've seen a decline in our summer shootout participants because there's less places for them to run. So if we're not running, or Atlanta Motor Speedway's not running in the southeast, for example, there's the smaller tracks have closed around to where they, so there's more of a consolidation. So we have to step up our game to keep that program uh, going in a forward direction uh, at, and run more at our facilities. Um, so I think that's where the consolidation is coming in. Um, but I think short track racing is healthy. I think it, it's, it's alive, it's well. I myself am a uh, small team owner. My five-year-old son is a USAC quarter midget racer. Um, and, uh, so I'm sorry I'm for in, your pocketbook. Yes, I'm mad at my money. <laughs> I'm mad at my money. Um, but, it, you know, there's 100 cars that show up every Saturday to run in North Carolina and Salisbury, Indiana to do that. So um, from five years old to 16 years old. So I think, I think it's healthy. I think it's just a matter of, of the consolidation that we're going through with the, the economy that we've had and the struggles that we have. But I think it will see a brighter day. Uh, going forward. I, I think it's shifted a little bit too that um, just a, a standard weekly short track program, I, I, those may be struggling, but these big events, we live in a world today where uh, instant gratification and everybody gets all excited and, and we want something special and unique. And so I think what you're seeing is these special events um, that, that you hold um, they're the ones that do well, right? You know, just, just a, a weekly program, just show up and race. If it's back gate driven, you probably can survive on that, but there's not a lot of front gate. People want glitz and glamour. I mean, you know, the folks from GRC are here, and they do a great job of putting together, you know, eight or nine weekends of, holy cow, that was amazing, you know? Um, and, and I think that if you go that direction, if you, if you really give people something special, I think is what, what you have to focus on. And you guys, you do a ton of events, Sean, but your big events, you know, the, the – uh, 
the world finals and stuff like that. They're, they're huge right now. I, I, I think that if you put together something that's really special, I think people, people will come. Dennis is sleeping back there. You're okay. Yeah. Jim Kerr, and I'm with Auto World Promotions. I work with Oscar Kowaliski. We work back and forth with each other. I like the tracks to address the ADA portion of their services. I looked at a bunch, and I've been to several tracks who have an excellent ADA. They take the disability thing very seriously. Indianapolis R Raceway Park, and the motor speedway especially, we went for the 100th anniversary. And it was great, and they treated everything good. All you saw in the papers and on the TV, how to get to the track the most efficient way. What they didn't tell us was how to get out of the track at the end of the race. So after three and a half hours, that was kind of fun. But I think we're missing the boat in not catering to some of the gray-haired people who are grandfathers and would like to take their sons and their sons, their grandkids, to the races and make it easy for them. They would like to be able to go to the parking lot, have a place to park, have people pick them up, take them inside, and I think we're missing the boat you know, there. If you have an event that's lasting all day, there are several scooter companies that will rent scooters. And in one case up in Syracuse, We've got 8,000 cars come to a custom car show, and the guy brings the tractor trailer full and has no problem renting it. So in other areas, they come and they'll try to sell some scooters, but they'll also bring some to rent. I think we're missing the boat there. I do mostly the drag racing end of it, and it looks like the Wednesday night, run what you brung, come race against your buddy. That seems to be flourishing pretty good. There's a new thing going on in Long Island right now, street racing, that I wasn't aware of, and it, I think it's new. It's a 30 mile per hour start. They don't have to worry about breaking their axles. They, it's a lot less attrition on the vehicles, and the vehicle that they run on a daily basis, they can take out and run. That's getting very strong. A lot of the parkways uh, late at night in Long Island are going to that. Thank you for your time. As I'm kind of repositioning myself, Frank, I'm going to ask you a question here. Um, in this racing business, people are so resistant to new things. You know, I get the answer, well, we haven't done it that way for the last 40 years. Are you seeing any of that uh, with your um, firefighting technology? Yeah, well, I mean, if you think the racing uh, business is like that, you should uh, uh, work in firefighting. Uh, it's, pro it's probably worse. Um, but uh, on the other hand, it is, it is logical to a certain extent. Uh, what we know works uh, training-wise is something that we feel comfortable with, so we, we, people like to stick with that. Um, and especially when you mention the word digital, um, the first thing that, uh, at least uh, with a part of the target group that comes to mind, is the word fake. Um, but I dare to say, and actually on Friday, we, we will we'll do, I think, a three o'clock do a demonstration with the, with the panels. If I would put the panels, uh, the digital panels here in a corner, flood this room with, uh, with smoke and we would walk, walk in, it would take you quite a lot of time to realize that this is not a real fire. So yes, the, uh, you will find some pushback on from the technology side, but uh, yeah, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, so it's all about getting it in, in front of people and, and to show them what it does. And in the end, training is, is not entertainment. It's, not, it's, it's nice if it's fun, but it's a very, very serious business. And it's all about repetition, and make sure the muscle memory is there for that moment, that unfortunate moment that we have an, an incident and we need to go uh, go out. Can I, can I make a follow on to Frank's comment Please. there? Uh, with safety in general, I think uh, it's been the way for a long, long time. Everybody's reactive and we have to start being a little more proactive and not wait for something to happen. Get ahead of the problem. Yeah, I agree with that. And one of the things that we've found, whether it's safety or whether it's entertainment, is that people are afraid of what they don't understand. So our business model has always been take the product to the customer or to the consumer, to the racetrack, and let them touch it, let them feel it, let them see how it works. I gotta be really careful because I got some customers in the room, so I do this to them all the time, but you give them <laughs> something really cool and then they don't wanna let go of it. Isn't that right, Chip? I mean, you know, you, you do it once and then you're like, 
it's now I'm stuck with Dusik, you know. Um, but but I think from a technology standpoint, I think that's how you bridge that gap is you you let them see it um, and you let them understand it. And once they understand it, they're th you, you're not af as afraid of it, whatever it may be. Exactly, and that's that's why we're teaming up with. Uh, uh ICMS and, uh, and with the FIA to make sure that uh, it, it gets the, the right attention on the right level. Um, and, so, and sooner or later, it's also gener uh, a thing about generations. I mean, the gen generations uh, uh, behind us are, are completely digital. So um, it won't be a problem for them, that's for sure. I think um, you know, change is definitely a struggling word, maybe a cuss <laughs> word at times <laughs> um, in our business as well. Uh, other than um, Hagen, who else in this room has figured out at their racetrack how training makes money? Is it is it profitable to anybody's racetrack or anybody's business? But it's so important. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in training uh, across the company of Speedway Motorsports, and it, it it's how we get out to our guest services staff and our track services teams and new cutting edge things that are out there. But it, it's so important, I can't stress that enough, that, that whether it's uh, how you interact with your fans and your guests, or it's the new latest and greatest um, uh, fence systems or fire systems, things like that, that that's important. And um, uh, that's, that's another thing that you, know, you look at your, your budget for the next year and you go, eh, do I need to train that much? Um, <laughs> yes, you probably do. Uh, Sean, you said you host 1,200 events a year. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> so, so for decades, Charlotte Motor Speedway has been a leader in a lot of things. And we have racetrack condos. And we have the first restaurant open every day uh, in the Speedway Club at the racetrack, which has a banquet facility that goes along with it. We have rooms like this um, at the Speedway. Um, so it could be a, a conference similar setup to this that we could host. Um, you know, we've got a um, chip. We've got a GRC team testing over at the dragway today. Um, a lot of those kind of things. So it could be 10, 12 people in a one-car test. It could be somebody on the drag strip, somebody, somebody on the oval, or it could be a function just like we have right here with full catering services and all that stuff. So it, yes, 12, 1,200 plus, a lot more than just racing. You know, I, I, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Doug. He's going to talk here in a little bit, but. We're seeing that at the Speedway, too, that, um, you know, when, when I first started 20 years ago, you know, we had one event at the Speedway, and the rest of the year you, you only had so many employees, um, and you, you survived on that. But now the way that the businesses operate, you've got a lot more overhead. We've got a lot more employees. You know, we've got bigger uh, administration buildings, and the parking lots are always over full, overfilled. And, and so when you've got all this overhead, you, you've just got these dormant racetracks that, that, that sit, and the Speedway is learning the same thing. The number of special events and things just like this that we do at the Speedway um, is, is growing exponentially with every day because it's, it's, it's there. Let's, let's utilize it, you know, and that – it, it, it seems to be working really well, and I, you know, I, I have a friend that says that really a racetrack, you should think of your racetrack like it's a restaurant with entertainment, you know, and it, it, to some degree it is. You just want to sell hot dogs. Who cares who you're selling them to? <laughs> Very good point indeed. Well, let's put a bow on this one, and then we have a special award to announce, too. Um, what did we learn from this panel? Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I learned also that there's no price to put on a life. I'm telling you, put me in my place, but don't be afraid of new technology. Um, change is inevitable except from a vending machine. So go ahead and embrace change and embrace new technology. These folks up on uh, the stage here, um, you know, Dave can help you out with some affordable ways to upgrade your equipment and the folks from Geobrug can make it safer and Hagen is going to revolutionize the way we train for fires. And while you may look at it and you say, I can't afford that now, look for some innovative company to be taking this around road shows for local tracks so they can, you know, train 20, 30, 40 tracks, um, you know, instead of just having one company have to buy that equipment right off offhand, get a chance to see how that technology works. And, also, keep up with the new technology that's going to be on the racetracks, including electric cars. Great question. Um, and I didn't even think of that one, so that's uh, very good. Let's give these gentlemen an applause here.